Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to those of you here in Missouri and people who are watching in the video cast. I'm Francis Collins, the director of NIH, in case you didn't know, but probably by now most of you have figured that out. And I'm really glad to be able to do the introduction today of the Wednesday afternoon lecturer. Now, this is Elizabeth Ophelia, who is going to speak to us about a very interesting topic with an interesting title, uh, Democratizing Discovery Science with N equals me. I'm sure we'll learn more about the uh, consequences of that particular equation uh, as uh, Elizabeth comes and speaks to us. Uh, she is, at the present time, Professor of Medicine and Senior Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Research at Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, she's a cardiologist. She got her undergraduate training and her MD in Nigeria and then a master's in public health uh, from Johns Hopkins. And after that, I did internal medicine residency in Oklahoma, followed by cardiology fellowship and a bit of time on the faculty at Wash U in St. Louis. But since 1994, uh, she has been at Morehouse, where, as I mentioned, she's now a senior associate dean. She has done a number of things that are worth mention here, but I don't want to take too much of her time. She was the first woman to serve as president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. Uh, she's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, she has been an NIH grantee in various guises, one of which I think she may tell you about uh, today, which is the National Research Mentoring Network, uh, which is a major investment to try to improve opportunities for traditionally underrepresented groups uh, to find their way into scientific careers, uh, a program that we're very excited about. Her research has focused particularly on underrepresented populations as well as uh, various aspects of cardiology, particularly in the area of hypertension. And she is a notable voice in this area that we are particularly focused on right now about how we could do a better job uh, of doing research that would both point to the causes and better yet, what effective implementations might be to deal with the problem of health disparities. So I'm particularly delighted uh, to be able to introduce her and ask you all, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Ophelia. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for those kind uh, words. And it is really my distinct uh, pleasure and honor to be here. And I thank the selection committee for this um, opportunity. As Dr. Collins said, I will be speaking about this title that I call Democratizing Discovery Science with N Equals Me. And as you'll see, this is an attempt to begin to ask the question, how can we be more inclusive in getting individuals that are traditionally underrepresented in medicine, in research, to be more engaged? And we had to borrow from social sciences, behavioral science, and as a cardiologist, I'm straying a little bit far afield, so clearly I needed a lot of collaborators. So I really welcome you to critique this work and give me your honest feedback. In terms of my disclosures, I have a patent uh, with my work at Morehouse School of Medicine that's focused on a system and method for chronic illness care. And it is also in a tech transfer faculty startup in collaboration with Morehouse School of Medicine. So I would like to be able to just remind us, and I know all of us in this room are aware of that at NIH, in terms of the challenge of diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, and certainly in the new initiative with precision medicine, that would involve one million person cohort. Believe we have an opportunity with mobile technology, especially as we look at the engagement of minority patients and underserved populations. There's also now the new research that's allowing us to link behavior change to clinical research participation, especially when we're talking about chronic health management, as you'll see. 
I'd like to introduce this concept of P4 Women's Health, which is a predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory process that's making its way into our intervention. And of course, as Dr. Collins mentioned, I am interested in how we integrate NIH research networks, a number of them at minority institutions, our collaborating partners, as we approach this difficult question of addressing health equity research. So I want to begin where I really started to have these kinds of ideas, at the bedside or in the community. This is FNO. She's a 76-year-old woman with hypertension, diagnosed with diabetes in November of 2011. And at that time, her hemoglobin A1C was 11. She was soon introduced to Frankie as a health coach. And this is in the context of a research program that's sponsored by our CTSA at that time. This is the Atlanta Clinical Translation of Science Institute. Six months later, she had lost 25 pounds, which is how you see her now. Her A1C is 5.5. She is off metformin. Blood pressure is 116 over 69 on two medications. She monitors her blood pressure, blood glucose daily, and tracks her activity as she walks two to five miles six days a week. So what you see there is essentially the data that she gets back. So the monitoring process is actually using the type of phone that she has in her hands, which is an Android phone. And the blood pressure devices are on the Health Vault platform, so they can come back in a synchronized manner to the phone. She's able to track it over several months or weeks, depending on her appointment schedule, able to respond and when you look at the blood pressure graph there, you see it's color-coded in red, yellow, green. That just allows her in a very quick way to know whether she should act or not. And then when she shares the data with her doctor during a visit, it allows for a more effective um, clinical encounter. So clearly, this technology is, is becoming more common. The problem is a lot of the individuals that are using it tend to be those that are relatively well or just want to be physically active. We're having a challenge getting it in the hands of individuals that have chronic illnesses. As you know, chronic diseases are the leading causes of death and disability in the United States. And we are talking about heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, obesity, arthritis as in the more common ones. And obviously, they're quite expensive. But interestingly, as we look at the numbers of adults affected, around 117 million people with at least one chronic disease, and recognize that clearly there are some behavior risk factors that are associated, commonly we will recognize lack of exercise or physical activity, poor nutrition, things that we can actually track and integrate into our care. One of the challenges here, as all of us know, is what is it that would enable us to sustain physical activity from a behavior change standpoint? And when we look at the amount of money that's involved, $264 billion, clearly it's a major impact to the healthcare system. But what is exciting to us as we began to approach this challenge is the evidence that among individuals who are living with chronic disease, self-monitoring or tracking of health indicators appear to affect how an individual will actually respond and act on that chronic disease. And I'm not showing that information here, but it turns out that minority patients and African Americans are actually more likely to track in some fashion not necessarily electronically, but in some fashion. So we thought that was an opportunity. 
And so that brings me to the other area that we believe is a huge opportunity. And many of us were very excited when President Barack Obama, in, in the State of the Union address before this last one, January 2015, said, we have an opportunity to look at new medical breakthroughs. And this is, again, what the NIH, through the uh, innovation around here, as well as with the director, have put out an initiative called the Precision Medicine Initiative. Now, obviously, there's an opportunity to integrate technology, genome science, as well as behavior, and environmental risks. However, I think the question is relevant when we ask this. How will the Precision Medicine Initiative ensure diversity and inclusion? The reason this question is important is this most recent IOM uh, round table, which I was uh, a participant in. And it simply asked, it presented some strategies for ensuring diversity, inclusion, and meaningful participation in clinical trials. There were no major breakthroughs at the workshop, but there was a challenge. We were all asked to continue to look at innovations in digital technology, community engagement in addressing this critical problem. So back at our institution and with our collaborators, we are looking at the fact that an, an individual obviously is part of an entire ecosystem that includes obviously family members, social networks, and other macro level environmental interactions. And we know that this has impact on disease, but we don't really know, number one, how to properly document and integrate these various factors, and how to actually ask the question, are we influencing any of these behaviors or changes when we do any form of intervention in chronic disease? So just to remind us, and this is sort of where I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. In terms of individual factors, we know that an individual has to have some skill set. There's the biology, there is whatever their demographic um, category is, and of course, motivation. And the networks around them we're finding, whether it's the peers or family, friends, community, plays an important role. And we won't talk about these. I will mention an activity with the church setting, as well as within a health system. But obviously, these are our opportunities as we begin to understand better how to measure and document and put it to use for any given individual. So this is the way we started out with this technology. This is actually, again, this research was funded by um, the National Center for Advanced and Translational Science, as well as National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities through our respective programs at Morehouse and the Atlanta CTSA. This woman is a diabetic woman. This gentleman, is a member of the Health and Welfare Ministry of this church called Big Bethel AME Church. What was really special about this church is that the minister was interested in this type of initiative that involves technology. They have lots of diabetics, and our research team was interested in understanding more about this, led by Dr. Priscilla Pimo at Morehouse School of Med from Morehouse School of Medicine. So there was a unique way to engage. Remember, this is not a health system. I didn't mention that. This is actually in the church setting. And the, as you can see, there's, you, don't, you can't see really the monitor because there's a privacy screen related to that. And subsequently, this technology is now on the iPhone, and I'll share some of that in just a few slides, as well as the Android phone. But here's an encounter with a trusted church member. And one of the interesting things we found, so we, we, in, we evaluated about 300 individuals. Roughly half of them were in the church setting, and the other half were in primary care practices. The individuals in the church setting did much better. 
We also did an assessment, and I'll show you some of the data in just a few slides. Some assessment with the city of Atlanta, which is a work site, and we totally, the whole thing did not work. And later on, we found out that in the, in the work setting, people are reluctant to engage about their health. It would make sense now that we've sort of gone through it, but at first, we thought we could do it in a church too. And why didn't it quite work in the doctor's office? It worked, but not as dramatically as you can see in terms of short-term measures of control of blood pressure. And you'll see from some of the qualitative assessments that these participants had some unique connection with these health coaches as they participated. So we'll come to that in just a few slides, but I just want to introduce what we call this Health 360X. Again, it is a patient engagement technology. This is exactly how we present it to the participants. We keep it very simple. We use large font so they'll understand, and they know that this would allow them to engage their health, manage their health, but also interact with a health coach or a physician. They're able to view, record, and print their health data. They're able to manage health through this mobile app, and they're able to connect not just with physicians and health coaches, but with an online community. And how do I use it? We teach them in sessions, and then they work with the coach in terms of how they can assess blood pressure, blood glucose, track fitness, identify and track nutrition, and manage their medications. They can download this technology from the Apple Store or the Android Store. They, we have an opportunity to integrate the American Association of Diabetes curriculum that helps them, and we can track when they've worked with the curriculum or not. Some of the curricular aspects is based on a web platform because we can't put all of that on an iPhone. And we share with them that there is a lockbox, we have security, and all of the data is stored at the Data Coordinating Center, which is an RCMI Translational Research Network partner of Morehouse School of Medicine. And the big thing, or the most important thing that the participants seem to enjoy is that they can interact with coaches, essentially we're calling them e-patients, and that they can also interact with each other and their physician. Well, what is the theoretical basis of this um, process? Well, so this is what's known as the Patient-Centered Consumer Health Information Technology application. It does incorporate constructs, and we use a system called the COM-B, which speaks to a way to track, assess, and manage behavior. And there's an accountability element to that. And these individuals that work with this get to have, get the incentive and feedback based on this behavior construct. And what is in that construct? You have the elements that I just mentioned within the technology that allows you to look at curriculum, allows you to measure, allows you to create and share stories about your health. But also importantly, we're able to look at capability and enhance capability, that's why it's highlighted. We're able to look at opportunities for behavior change and we're able to test motivation. And again, this determines whether or not, or, or this, the levels of these changes help us figure out, do we need to do more training and go back to some of our intervention elements? So in our initial assessment, about 300 participants were involved, average age 62, and 44% were over 65 years old, and 70% women, and of course, they were more overweight, uh, obese, as, as a matter of fact, 64% were obese. 
um, and of course the diabetes. This is what, again, they see on a regular basis and that the health coach works with them on. And some of them dive deeper in terms of nutrition and activity, but this is the basic assessment and uh, monitoring. Let's see. So what did we learn? Again, I want to give credit to Dr. Priscilla Pimu who led this effort. Um, starting with the baseline blood pressure for a diabetic that's high, we were able to sustain significant reduction at 12 weeks and maintained it at 52 weeks. The difference between 12 weeks and 52 weeks is there was a health coach involved on a regular basis. There was a weekly assessment by the health coach. But at the end of 12 weeks, the health coach was only participating on an as-needed basis. So it was important that we were able to show some persistence. But again, this is a small number of participants, but we were quite excited, especially since we saw more of an impact, as I mentioned, Com, uh, on the, with the church group compared to the health system group. And this is the blood glucose. And physical activity also increased. One of the uh, questions that folks asked us as these data were being presented was that, what are some of the barriers that we encountered? And we did some uh, just qualitative as well as semi-quantitative assessment and use focus groups. And one of the, um, the information that was tracked was how long people stayed with the app and stayed to track behavior before they disconnected just to test persistence. And it didn't seem like age or ethnicity were a barrier to engaging. Similarly, whether an individual owned a computer or not, it didn't seem to be a barrier. When they wanted to work on a laptop that was available at the church or other like grocery stores, but many of them worked with the phone, as you saw with our example. One of the other items that was evaluated was what is an individual's ability to use a computer based on a, a scale that we provided? Um, as you can see, on ABLE 0, 1, 2, or ABLE 3, 4, and 5. And again, there did not seem to be a clear difference in terms of engagement. Now, all we're talking about is, are they engaged, are they using it, or are they checking out? What we did notice, though, was individuals that either had anxiety about their ability to use the internet, or discomfort with putting their health information online experienced significant barriers. So they were, if they had anxiety, they were less likely to be in the 25th plus percentile, or if they also were uncomfortable, disagreed, in, in other words, they were uncomfortable, they were also less likely to remain engaged. So one of the conclusions in this um, assessment, in this um, research, as conducted by Dr. Pimu, was that these, um, we wanted to see what was it that led some people to persist versus not. And the themes that were looked at from a behavior change standpoint were empowerment and engagement, and those popped out as they pulled that out. And I just wanna, so they're working on a significant word cloud later on, but I just wanted to pull out some thoughts here because it resonated across the board. I met the group uh, as they finished their, their, their work, and one of the comments that I thought was relevant here is, from uploading it, my last update, what was that Monday, and I was looking over the graph, it was telling me, I guess, my sugar was kinda high, and it said that I need to reduce my salt intake. So there's an active engagement and interaction here. So if you know that, and we really get into it, and after we upload the information, I notice it's giving me back information, things that I can do to help myself. From the standpoint of empowerment, yes. The other thing is, when you have to go to a doctor, you take time out, but with this system, I have it in my hands, and I can interact with it, 
and learn from my health coach, and that is essentially what that comment was about. It is right there in front of you in the screen. So it really did seem, and then the, the bottom one is saying, I'm learning and I'm learning, and again, it's helping me with my diabetes as well as learning on the computer. And you will recall that these individuals were not necessarily highly educated or um, young. It makes it easier because you, you have someone that you can talk to. We're kindred spirits because we have the same condition. We didn't know until I saw this data just how lonely it is, how diabetics feel about problems like this. So I'm going to go on to just how this was then um, evaluated on the next stage. The conclusion was that having these kinds of technology is not just, people are not just going to adopt it. We're going to need to put in effort to help them identify themselves in the technology through their measurements. This is part of my take on that N equals me because I'm learning about myself and it seems to relate to how well I actually engage in terms of my health and follow-up. So I just want to switch gears to a more um, traditional research where we looked at individuals with obesity but once again trying to figure out how to use visuals to engage in long-term behavior modification. So this is uh, obviously uh, an expression profile, a gene expression, and one of the, let me just um, orient. So we've got, I know you can't read this from there, but these are the lean individuals to the right of this uh, heat map, and the obese individuals. And what we notice, obviously, is upregulation on inflammatory factors, and downregulation um, among the obese in terms of upregulation of inflammatory factors and downregulation of uh, immune factors. So these are what some of these uh, markers are. The, but the main thing that we share with our participants is it is different. It is a different heat map if you have, um, if you're lean versus if you're obese, kind of opposite. And the other thing we share with them, it seems, you know, and, and they got it. We tell them that because these are premature cells, the progenitor cells that we assessed in this test, that means there's a potential for this to become a permanent part of their vascular function. There's an abnormality of the blood vessel and a predisposition to infections as a result of this kind of um, gene expression and upregulation based simply on obesity. So we share this information with our community group. So this gentleman is the chair of our community advisory board. And he came along with us to the radio station and spoke up about what needed to be done. And so here we've essentially recruited him as a citizen scientist, because we didn't have to have that communication. This is another uh, model that we're testing uh, to see how their engagement persists based on their, um, their interaction and knowledge of this science. I want to remind everyone that going into the community takes a lot of effort. So we at Morehouse School of Medicine have a mobile research unit, which is the first of its kind in Georgia that's strictly used for research. And as you can see, we can do exams and do stress testing in the back here, since I'm a cardiologist. We can park this in major um, health fairs as well as indoor activities. This is actually inside. Um, and we set up tents and we do all of these assessments. This is a, clinic, um, a community nurse. This is actually a Master of Science trained nurse, and she's a, um, she provides communication to the participants. She's always on the mobile unit. And you can't see this here. This is free screenings, and I know many of you recognize that. Folks will come if we provide them a strategy to also get some health care. So the way we decided to work with this opportunity 
is to engage some um, strategy that we learned from Dr. Leroy Hood when he visited Morehouse School of Medicine, known as P4 Medicine. It's simply a systems approach to addressing prevention. It is, we're, fo we're focusing on women because as you saw, there's lots of obesity and we have a lot of uh, women that have an active interest. So this is a model that's based on predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory health screening in this case. And this is a, a technology that is actually available, but the model that we're using is, uh, was developed by a collaborator in Minneapolis. It looks at arterial stiffness and identifies non-invasively disease of the blood vessel. So we're able to run this uh, particular assessment in the field. And as you can see here, there's, um, there is actually a very good, she's young, so she has very good profile. But it's a visual, you can visually look at a normal waveform versus an abnormal waveform. And this is very helpful as we engage in the field. This, is, this uh, particular technology has been tested in the MESA study, as well as in a number of other individuals that are not necessarily African Americans, but did show a separation that was even much better than Framingham in terms of the event rate for those that have abnormal um, waveform versus those that have a normal waveform. And we took it on the road, and as you can see, this is actually a Lynx. This is a large African-American women's organization. This was in Birmingham. We drove the unit to Birmingham and set stage. There were over 1,000 women in this room. What was amazing to me was their willingness to come in and, and queue up and be in line to participate. Um, but we had to do a modification. The screening was entirely free. And we similarly recently went to the National Medical Association, and this time we were looking at women physicians. It is interesting, um, when I pulled up this data, I thought, because these were individuals that a large percentage of them had graduate degrees or PhDs in some college, that we would not find the type of risks that we were observing. But of course, a third of them had some uh, problem in terms of blood pressure. This is what we look at in terms of the elasticity. Two thirds was abnormal, abnormal compliance. This is a very high number, much higher than what we had seen in any other review. And again, the numbers are not large, but we were quite alarmed by the number of disease vessels that we saw. And it didn't matter whether we looked at large arterial compliance or small arterial compliance. So one of the questions that came up as we did this assessment was, would it matter to these women? And what we found was these women were willing to take action. We found the same thing at NMA as they saw the data. So the visual is important. So the next question that we wanted to ask is, if we engage these individuals, will they persist in some online forum, learning about their health, joining with the health coach, and recording activity with our online tool? The data that we saw is, we have had over a period of just a couple of months, some mobile installs, some registered users as you see, and this is uh, some social media stuff that I don't completely understand, but I was told that um, lifetime impressions of 79,000 is a good thing, but I don't know. I'd kind of like to have a million myself. Because it's... But here's uh, you know, the demographics again. It is a broad range, young people as well as middle-aged individuals and very few elderly at the social media um, point in okay, broader ge geography. Interestingly, I just want to point to this. 
Um, there's a lot of um, traffic based on individuals that have interest in health, mind, and body, as well as biotechnology. And so we now have an, a Health 360X online community that's part of our research at Morehouse School of Medicine. And so we do events and people sign up and every, every, from time to time, they would create uh, specific uh, incentives to engage the community. So the way I think about this is, while mobile technology is not new, what is new here and what we think is innovative is the opportunity to engage individuals that are traditionally difficult to engage and sustain that engagement, because it opens the door for us to do a number of other things. Right now, they're just going in when they want, learning about their health. We post a lot of information about specific diseases that maybe is more common, lots of information about diabetes, diet, and many people want to know about that. So in trying to go to the next stage, I just want to bring up a problem and a challenge that we have in clinical medicine. So I'm a cardiologist and kind of been talking to you about other things beyond cardiology. So this is a pro, as you, for those of you who can read, this says November 2004. And it showed that this combination drug, isosobide dinitrate hydralazine in blacks with heart failure. And what the conclusion was in the New England Journal of Medicine was the addition of a fixed dose of isosorbide dinitrate plus hydralazine to standard therapy for heart failure, including neurohormonal blockers, is efficacious and increases survival among black patients with advanced heart failure. For those of you who are not cardiologists, you'll ask, so, you know, what's the big deal? The big deal with this is, prior to this, we did not have drugs that worked effectively among blacks. And so this was the study, and it showed a mortality advantage, and the guidelines were changed right away after the study was published. But this analysis was conducted by one of my colleagues, Greg Fonero, looking at guidelines in, ho in hospitals. And what it essentially said was that less than 20% of eligible patients we're getting this therapy. So this is another problem that we have. Even when we have good therapy, doctors don't necessarily prescribe it, and this is where we have an opportunity to look at not just a new drug, but how are we using, as physicians, how are we using existing therapy? This is where I'd like to introduce our partners across the research centers and minority institutions. There are 18 such institutions around the country, and as you can see, they're spread out. So we have coverage in terms of African Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, as well as Hispanic. Now, the importance of this is, these are NIH-funded centers. Five of them are health systems and they have a community partnership similar to what I shared from Morehouse. And I think our challenge is to integrate these institutions in the broader opportunities within NIH in terms of what we're talking about with regard to precision medicine. These, these, are, these um, institutions already have a network that they partner with and we have a data coordinating center, as well as we work on a common IRB rely agreement. Another partnership that I think is relevant to what happens with precision medicine is the PCORI Clinical Data Research Network. And this is a particular initiative that the RCMI is engaging in collaboration with Harvard um, Medical School. And I'm just going to very quickly say, to me, what is exciting about this is the EMR does not have to be touched. Basically, this I2B2 technology is able to be sort of what we call a sidecar. And as you can see, there are many health systems involved, including Morehouse and Grady. 
and now we are bringing in three RCMI partners, Howard, Meharry, as well as University of Puerto Rico. We're able to query the database remotely, identify individuals based on ICD codes, and then part of the partnership is also related to network of physicians who are out in the community partnering with us. So this, I borrowed this slide from my colleague who works with uh, NASA. And NASA has been interested in this N equals one syndrome studies because they like to identify astronauts and figure out what is the opportunity with, uh, with astronauts um, because they're special individuals. But we are, we are basically using that model and suggesting that every patient who could potentially be participating if they can get their information in a meaningful way would allow us, much like we, we saw with FNO, engage our process. So I, my, the, the slide blinked out on me. I had, and I'm gonna just verbally describe it, uh, the National Research Mentoring Network is a network that is, um, Dr. Francis Collins mentioned, it is a part of our, what we call a diversity consortium. Dr. Hannah Valentine, who's sitting right here, uh, many of you know, is leading this effort. And one of the opportunities we have is the, the, the infrastructure has been, is being set up for uh, actually actively engaging trainings as well as professional development and happening in terms of what we call my NRMN. And because I don't have the slide, I have to remind you because I see my Dr. Mercedes Rubio and Dr. Mike Sesma, they're here. So you guys need to make sure you check out my NRMN and um, you can join as a mentor, you can join as a scholar, and there are all kinds of training opportunities. But we actually think what's, mo what's even more exciting is that we have an opportunity to participate in collaboratory spaces, which is in process, so that individuals who have specific um, affinity groups or research areas can find like-minded individuals and be actively engaged. In conclusion, diversity and inclusion in clinical research requires multi-level patient-centered approaches. Research networks like the RCMI that invest in the health of minority and underserved communities offer opportunities to link clinical research with health services of those communities. Mobile technology with an N equals me intervention approach and social networks that include coaching and peer mentoring are testable models of scientific discovery. The model should support workforce diversity using a community-based participatory and team science approach. The other slide that I lost was one that was actually uh, describing a cardiovascular disease registry and this is in collaboration with the Association of Black Cardiologists and is really looking, the, the, the problem I shared with you about heart failure where individuals are not getting the drugs that they need. So we are now engaging not just academic centers but uh, ABC, the cardiologists in private practice to look very critically at even after a drug is approved, can we identify what works best for which patient? Pretty much the framework of the Precision Medicine Initiative. So this is an exciting time, and as I come to the conclusion, I do wanna acknowledge many individuals that are part of this work, the faculty, staff, and trainees of the Clinical Research Center at Morehouse School of Medicine, the Community Advisory Board and Community Physicians Network of Morehouse School of Medicine, the Atlanta Clinical and Translational Science Institute, which is a collaboration with Emory University, Morehouse School of Medicine, Georgia Institute of Technology, Grady Health System, Emory University Hospital, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and other partners in the Atlanta and Georgia uh, community. Investigators, staff, trainees, and community partners at the 18 RCMI institutions and the RCMI Translational Research Network, the PCORNet Clinical Data Research Network with the primary institution at Harvard, 
Investigator staff and consortium partners of the National Research Mentoring Network and the Diversity Consortium. And of course, I'm grateful to my patients and staff at Morehouse Healthcare and the relevant grants are identified there. And I thank you all very much for your attention. slides. Thank you so much, Dr. Ophelia. We can take some questions. Please come to the microphone. Yes, please. Uh, the measurements such as glucose and blood pressure, are those taken autonomously or are those taken via health clinic visits? So it was taken at home. So these are, so on the Health Vault platform, they set up this supercomputer that allow all devices, so device manufacturers just put their devices on. So it doesn't matter what, you know, once a patient um, buys, like for example, it could be an Omron, which is a home blood pressure monitor, okay, so or a blood glucose, and you can just monitor it, and because we're connected and part of that uh, ecosystem or technology um, interaction with Health Vault, we get the data so patients don't have to enter it. It might, might be of interest to you that last Wednesday, to the best of my knowledge, the FDA approved the artificial pancreas of Medtronic, which is uh, autonomous uh, glucose monitoring and insulin injection. I'm not sure if it's like uh, a closed loop 100% or it doesn't have to be checked or whatever. I didn't right. read the particulars. But that would be something very interesting in the field that would, uh, it's, apparently the FDA agrees that it takes down blood glucose to the point uh, reliably enough right. to uh, that might be something you might want to integrate sure. in your studies, no? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, please. Congratulations for covering some of the areas for the patients yeah. in the area of heart disease, diabetes, chronic disease. So how is the adherence rate? How is the dropout rate for the patients you are following? Yes, so that's a very good question. So the actual dropout rate was very low, and the reason, really the main thing that makes this uh, system work are the health coaches. Because the health coaches, we, we have like, for example, a patient as part of the, 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 the church community that was not showing up to the doctor, and the health coaches get involved with it. In the real world, though, of clinical practice, we're having to replicate this using what we call care coordinators. So these are navigators who would interact in almost like, uh, you know, like the way social workers would do. Um, but, you know, it's, even though it seems like a complicated thing, the numbers of individuals that need that level of engagement are relatively small. But the key is to identify them because if you don't, they, they come back over and over again. I did mention this, but we have an initiative with our accountable care organization called Morehouse Choice ACO that includes Grady Hospital, which is a safety net hospital, two large federally qualified centers, and looking at diabetes and asking through a Medicare shared savings program, which means if you save money, Medicare will share it with you. They were able to save $3 million from taking care of these, uh, not a lot, but very high risk patients. So I think that um, they're now increasing data, and because our patients are very high risk, CMS is interested in uh, replicating the model in a larger uh, group of individuals. But that's a good question. Um, thank you. Well, thank you, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Feely, for a wonderful talk. Um, I have. A a question around the um, inclusion yes. uh, and participation in clinical trials, somewhat related to the, um, the, the core of your talk here. Can you tell us a bit about, are we seeing any improvements uh, and increases in the participation rates, and right. how can we further augment that? Right, that's a very good question. The good news is we actually are seeing improvements. But it does take uh, the type of infrastructure that I was describing, where we've got members of the community that have come in to be part of our research to go out, especially when we start talking about storing samples and doing biopsies and things that we need for genetics. And people get really anxious. Um, 
behavior protocols like the one that I showed a lot easier to recruit for. But whenever you have to donate samples or people get suspicious, so the, the more intense the intervention, the more you're going to have to engage in terms of making sure individuals understand that you know you're sort of you you they need to know what all the protections are but even so one of the things that they've shared with us is we don't want you to come just when you have a protocol come all the time and so we actually spend time every weekend with some community or the other doing some of this outreach and it pays off when we then have to go out and do the protocol so we are recruiting much better at least within our community great so just one other quick question. When I saw your title, um, <laughs> N equals me, yeah. I immediately thought about the rash of um, scientists who actually publish their own genomes um, ah, with that's a view right. to um, encouraging this approach and showing that it works for N equals one or yeah. N equals me. So my question is, are you seeing in your patients an opportunity to do this um, and yes. to engage them to do yes. this work. Yes, in fact, so so we the the vascular testing tool is the opportunity we've had to actually engage this. And um, one of the questions that have come up, and they've they've been willing. They said, you know, I don't understand why I have an abnormal vascular scan. Um, tell me what else I need to do. So I think when people believe that they're receiving some information of value, then they will go the next step because everybody wants to be better. And so they were storing their samples and, and they know that you know when we get resources, we will do the genomics testing. But the bigger, the other question they always ask is, are you going to return the information to me? And I think that's the other part that we need to be very clear about that this is your data, it'll come back to you, and when we use it, you're not identified. Because people are very anxious about, about that. That's a good question. Thank you, Dr. Valentine. Uh, I'm intrigued by this concept of the citizen scientist. Yes. Uh, for example, how much training does it take to be one of your health coaches? A lot of training. So the health coaches tend to be just regular people. So for example, we had 10 health coaches because the health coaches had to have a, have a panel of individuals at any one time. And we trained them on the technology, we trained them on diabetes, and we trained them on how to interact in terms of a communication. Some of them are, you know, maybe they have a relative who has diabetes or they have an interest in some health uh, related uh, field but generally they are not clinicians, they are not nurses. Um, they generally have either, um, at least many of them have either high school or higher uh, education. Um, but we find that as long as the curriculum is well laid out, that they're able to follow it. And we do use, like if it's a diabetes, we bring an expert on diabetes to help them with the, with the training. And, and have you found that it has to be culturally sensitive? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's sort of part of what I was, the, 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 the communication that they were uh, sharing with us, the participants themselves uh, were indicating. Um, one of the reasons I really became even more excited about this was when we brought them everybody back, um, we saw individuals that were essentially crying because they said, we didn't think anybody cared enough about me. So the health coach really has to play a big role. And now I'll tell you what I didn't tell you in the beginning because it'll help you understand how I became a believer here. That's that N equals me, <laughs> Dr. Valentine. So FNO actually happens to be my mother. I didn't put her in the protocol, so I'm, I don't have a conflict. She, once she had diabetes, she had done everything right. She was extremely depressed because she felt that she's an, an, a retired nurse. She thought she was doing everything she needed to do. And I was dealing with her, you know, when I got home from work. And then one day I got home and she was very excited. She said, Frankie is coming. I said, who's Frankie? She says, my health coach. I said, oh. 
I came back that day and she was all smiles. She said, look, Frankie said, this is a nurse and I'm a doctor and I developed the technology. And she said, Frankie said, I must not get to Orange or there's a problem. I said, Orange is just 131. She says, no orange. <laughs> she and Frankie got into an amazing you know, interaction. They would share recipes, they would do different things. So I really feel, of course, that's the N equals one, but we saw it and among all of the individuals that participated. And I think that's why it was more, she participated with the church group, that it was better in the church group because in practices, people were doing a lot of other things. They didn't have the time to engage and just, you know, have the rapport with these individuals so they feel like somebody cares about me. So. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to ask one last question. Sure. And uh, you had an impressive number of women. Yes. 70% women participants. Have you looked at whether this is as effective in women as it is in men? or vice versa? Right, so that's a very good question. Um, we tend to track more women in terms of diabetes, but we did have men, and there was no difference in the, in the response rate for men versus women. There was a difference based on if people did not, because we can track how frequently they got on the, uh, the curriculum. We can, we can check that out. If they don't engage with the curriculum, that's when we saw a difference. So, Gender didn't seem to play a role as long as they engaged. So please join me in thanking Dr. Ophelia, and we have a reception in the library. Please join us there. <laughs>